of review. Uh, this is a week in which we are going to coast into uh, the first exam of the semester. Um, and we're going to do that by taking a step back uh, this week and looking at everything that we've done up until this point. So all of the topics and the learning standards that you've worked on so far and taking some stock of them. Um, just trying to figure out um, uh, sort of how they all work, iron out any of the creases uh, that remain in your in your thinking uh, about this in advance of our exam. So what have we done uh, up until this point in the course? We really talked about two main topic areas. The first one is sets. So how do mathematicians use sets as ways of thinking and reasoning about collections of objects? Um, so our most powerful tool in the land of sets is the Venn diagram, the great visual representation uh, that can let us put a lot of information into a diagram coming from sets, but maybe more importantly, get a lot of good information out of a Venn diagram. Using a Venn diagram to communicate membership in two or more sets is the most important strategy, the most important tool uh, in our whole first portion of what we've done so far. Uh, so our work on sets sort of spanned two different weeks of the semester. The first in which we kind of looked at the basics. How do we communicate about uh, sets? What are some different ways of using notation to express which elements are in a set and which are not? Um, and then Venn diagrams to depict a set visually. And then in the second week, we ratcheted that up a notch. We used Venn diagrams to answer questions about the equality of different combinations of sets using the operations of union, intersection, and complement. And then using three set Venn diagrams to represent the results of a three member survey problem. So how do we use the visual language of Venn diagrams to analyze uh, surveys in which respondents fall into two or three categories and disentangle uh, our Venn diagrams? The key principle, remember, is that in any Venn diagram, every element of our sets should appear in one and only one region. We can't put one element in more than one region in a Venn diagram. If you remember that, if that's your guiding light when you're working with a Venn diagram, then you're going to come out okay. So that was the first uh, sort of uh, phase of what we've done up until this point of the semester. And the second phase that we just did last week is our unit on logic and logical reasoning. And logic in a real sense is the, uh, is the underpinning of mathematics in general, but set theory in particular, uh, rests on top of a foundation of logic. Because to say whether an element is or is not an element of a set, that is a yes or no proposition. Set membership uh, is either true or false. So set membership is a logical proposition. So in our logic unit last week, we broadened that perspective out and asked what kinds of sort of everyday thought processes can be construed as processes of logical reasoning? How do mathematicians think about logic? What are ways to take logical propositions and combine them together to make more interesting and complex propositions and assess whether or not those more complex propositions are true or false? Those being the most important and also loaded words uh, in all of logic. And then the most important sort of uh, uh, the most important process uh, that we went through when we were talking about logic last week is the process of assessing a logical argument for the validity of its form. And that's a very different question. Assessing whether a, a logical argument is valid in form, that's a different question than whether or not something is true. And that's actually a distinction that I want us to underscore in our review today. Because uh, on a number of your quizzes, um, I gave the feedback that there is a big difference between assessing whether or not uh, a logical argument is sound, in other words, whether or not its conclusions are true, versus assessing whether its form is valid, which is really a question about whether its premises necessitate its conclusion. Regardless of whether any of those are true or false, would the truth of the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion? That's a question not about whether anything is true or false, but whether the form of the argument is such that the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. So I want to do some examples that will help to underscore that distinction as well to close up our, our, our review today. So those of you that are my students this semester, um, if you have particular questions that you'd like to see me address during the live stream, uh, please feel free to drop them into the Slack doctor's office channel and I'll address them as they arise. Um, otherwise, I have kind of a, a probably too ambitious uh, agenda of some topics that I want to get to during today's live stream that make an effort at covering the spectrum uh, of everything that we've done up until this point in the semester. So here's what I'm looking at. I want to first go back to the set basics, um, the talk about the language of sets. In particular, I want to dwell in that example on set builder notation. Um, 
because that seems to be the one form of communicating about sets that gives people the most heartburn uh, for obvious reasons. A set builder notation is a very precise way of communicating about sets, and it uses notation as shorthand. Um, it's a way that mathematicians tend to communicate about sets, but people outside of my field uh, tend to not use it as much. You're not going to find set builder notation on the front page of the New York Times anytime soon. Um, and so it's probably the form that you're least familiar with communicating in, so I want us to take some more time to pick that apart. And then I want to talk about operations on sets, unions, intersections, complements, just to get our heads back into that again. So that when we look at topic number two, set operations, we're ready to tackle some of those more complex problems about assessing the equality of sets using a Venn diagram um, and then taking apart survey problems, so representing survey data uh, in a three-set Venn diagram in particular. And then when we turn the corner into log logic and argument, um, I do want to spend a considerable amount of time reinforcing today that process of converting back and forth between the language of logic and the language of English. In other words, the language that um, logicians and mathematicians write and the language in which logicians, mathematicians, and we speak every day. Um, so that logic to English dictionary, I think, is an important and sort of undervalued skill in this, uh, in this material. So I want to spend some time on that for sure. Um, and then, as I said, I want to underscore that difference between what is it that makes an argument true and what is it that makes an argument valid. One is a question about the truth or falseness of the premises in the conclusion. And the other is an argument about whether or not the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. So really, assessing validity of an argument is an if-then kind of thing. If the premises are true, must the conclusion be true? So I want to do some examples. And our key tool there is going to be not the Venn diagram, but the Euler diagram, which is just a way of sort of doctoring up a Venn diagram uh, in ways that make it valuable to represent uh, the premises of an argument in ways that can help us understand whether the conclusions must therefore also be true. So that's sort of the uh, agenda uh, for what I want us to do together during today's live stream. Let me get my uh, canvas up here and ready to go. Sorry. Got a little bit of a late jump on the live stream today, so I've got a couple tools that I still need to adjust before we're ready to go. Uh, huh, 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 huh. Here we go, fix that. Uh, and then I'll go over here and open up this. Now I hope we are in better shape. Just have to make a couple more adjustments. OK. And I think we are good to go. Make that as big as I can. There we go. OK, terrific. So let's start by going back to the set basics. So when we first started talking about how mathematicians use sets to uh, communicate, um, one of our priorities was figuring out how to use various different types of language to communicate what belongs to a set and what doesn't. Um, so at the time, um, the most troublesome uh, topics uh, that we had to, to deal with were these different ways of representing uh, what elements belong to a set. Uh, here we go. Uh, so there were three main ways in which we used different forms of communication to describe sets. Uh, and they sort of span from the very explicit and concrete. The most explicit way to describe a set is just to list all of its elements. That's what we call a roster for a set. Um, and that's the method that probably everyone is the most comfortable with. Everyone, mathematicians included. If I can write down all the elements in a set, then I understand everything there is to know about that set. Um, unfortunately, that's not always either practical or in some cases possible to write down all the elements of a set. And so we have these other methods, um, a verbal method in which we literally just write down a sentence or maybe a paragraph, however long it needs to be, of English words or whatever the language uh, your vernacular is that describe as completely as possible what elements belong to the set and what do not. So tell me, it's in words, describe to me what belongs to this set. This is actually a mode of communication that for some reason when people get into a math class, people forget that language and words and sentences are a thing. I don't want you to forget that. Language and, and paragraphs and sentences and good grammar and spelling and all that stuff, 
that is how we communicate, mathematicians included. Um, and so if you're not using those verbal skills in your math class, you are working in math with one or maybe both hands tied behind your back. Um, so use your words uh, when thinking about a set. I very often use it as a as a stepping stone um, between different modes of communication. I'll write out completely, here's everything that I understand uh, about this set, um, so that I know at the next stage whether I'm still describing the thing that I thought I was describing in the beginning. So don't be shy to use those words. Write more than you think you need to write. Um, this is advice I give to my math majors. It's also advice that I give to you. Use your words. But probably the most troublesome form of describing a set is set builder notation, the one that we're kind of seeing a little bit of down here at the bottom of the screen, right? Um, in set builder notation, we use mathematical symbols to make the same kind of description about the membership of a set that we otherwise could have written using words. So the most logical, the most natural um, translation is between verbal and set builder methods of describing the membership in a set. Um, so I want us to spend some time uh, during our review today just getting practice going back and forth um, between set builder notation and verbal descriptions uh, for uh, the description of a set. So let me get a blank screen here real quick. And we'll just do a couple examples. So let's start with an example uh, where we are given a verbal description of a set. And we'll try and come up with a set builder description for that set. So I want us to get some practice going in both directions, both from verbal to set builder and also from set builder to verbal. So where to start? Um, let's suppose we say that A uh, is the set. So this is a verbal description. Uh, the set of all months of the year. In the usual Julian calendar that we use in the Western Hemisphere. right? Um, so that's a verbal description of the set A. Right? So I know for sure from this description whether something like June is an element of A, or whether something like uh, turtle is not an element of A, right? That's why set membership is a logical proposition. Either a given thing is an element of my set, or it is not an element of that set. It's either true or it's false. That's why logical propositions underpin our study of set theory. Okay, so if this is a verbal description for this set, how would we write a set builder notation version of this description? So anytime you're writing set builder notation, my recommendation is to first sort of give yourself a skeleton, and sort of flesh out, to give yourself some space to write down the both the left hand portion and the right hand portion of the set builder notation. Remembering that what goes on the left side is what we're going to look at last. How to turn uh, x's, which we're going to define on the right hand side, into set elements. And then on the right side, um, describe what uh, values the variable x may take. So just like when we're going the other direction from set builder back to verbal description, I like to think about what's on the right hand side of my set builder notation first before I think about what's on the left. So on the right side of my, my vertical divider, I'm going to describe some values that this placeholder, this variable x, is going to be allowed to take. And then on the left hand side of the vertical bar, I'm going to describe how to transform those x's into elements of my set. So the really naive way to do this, which is neither more or less correct than any other way, is just to write down the sentence, so don't be shy to also use verbal descriptions as part of your set builder notation, x is a month of the year. So in my set builder notation, that describes for me a collection of x's. x can be January, it can be July, it can be December, right? Um, and so that gives me a list of various x values. And it turns out that those x values are exactly the same thing as the elements that I want in my set. So on the left-hand side of my notation, I'm just going to write another x. Okay. So on the right side of this notation, I find out that x is going to be January, February, March, da-da-da, up to December. 
and then the left side of the bar I say those x's are exactly the elements that I want in my set. And so that gives me the, the connection here um, between the verbal and the set builder notation realms. So that's kind of an easy dip our toe in the water example. Um, but I want to do a couple that are a little bit more intricate um, that can show us kind of how we can, I don't know, get ourselves into a little bit more trouble. Let's do an example where we start with set builder notation instead. And so this time, in my set builder notation, I'm going to have on the right side x is an element of the natural numbers and x is less than or equal to 7. So there is a kind of verbal but really a sort of notational description of some values that the variable x is going to be permitted to take. And on the left hand side of this notation I'm going to write this x squared plus 1. So here is a set builder notation description of a set that I'm calling b. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to convert this set builder description for the set B. I'd like to convert it into a verbal. I just want to write out, if I were trying to describe this set of numbers for, I don't know, the Boston Globe. You know, maybe the Globe calls me up and says, hey, we need you to, you know, we need, we need you on the record <laughs> describing this set of elements to a general audience who doesn't want to see set builder notation, much like many of you probably don't want to see set builder notation. Spoiler alert, you're going to see some on the exam. So how would I describe verbally? Uh, what's going on with this set. Well, just like in our first example, the first place I look in my set builder notation is on the right side of the notation, because that's going to tell me which x's uh, are going to be uh, a part of my universe here. So to unpack this, x is an element of the natural numbers, the set of natural numbers. And remember, the set of natural numbers is a set of all numbers that we can use to count non-empty finite sets. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so on. All right. So x is taken from among those list of numbers. But those x's that we take are just those that are less than or equal to 7. So we don't get all the natural numbers. We just get those natural numbers that are less than or equal to 7. So in this description, the first thing that I observe is that the values that x can take is a relatively small uh, set. Right? There's actually only seven natural numbers that are less than or equal to seven. I'm actually going to make a little table of them. This is a method that I haven't done before, but you might find it helpful uh, when you're taking set building notation apart. I'm going to list now the values that x may take according to the description on the right hand side of this notation. Right? x is a natural number less than or equal to 7. That means that x is either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. So those are the values that x may take according to the right hand side of this notation. But these are not the elements of my set B. That's what this left hand piece of the notation does for us. It tells us how to transform those x's into elements of my set. And the expression x squared plus 1 is how we do it. So for each of these x values, I'm going to multiply it by itself to get x squared, and then I'm going to add 1 to the result. So for instance, when x is equal to 1, x squared plus 1 is going to be 1 squared plus 1. That's 1 plus 1. It's 2. And so here, I'll put 2 as the, well, let me color code this. That 2 is then one of the elements in my set. So maybe I'll take a moment and indulge uh, the desire to actually write down a roster for this set before we do a verbal description, perhaps. So I know that 2 is going to be one of the elements uh, in my set. And I'll just keep doing that same process for all the other values of x that were given to me here. When x is 2, 2 squared plus 1 is equal to 5. When x is 3, 3 squared plus 1 is 10. 4 squared plus 1 is 17. 5 squared plus 1 is 26. 6 squared plus 1 is 37. 7 squared plus 1 is 50. And so a roster for this set is just going to be a list of all those elements. 17, 26, 37, and 50. Okay.
So there then is a roster for this particular set. And if you're able to get there out of set builder notation, then you're in really good shape. But I do want to close out this example um, by um, just writing down how I would describe this set uh, to somebody writing a general interest article for the Boston Globe on mathematics. Right? I would look at this and I would say that B is the set of. So each one of these numbers was obtained by squaring a natural number and adding 1. And these happen to be the seven smallest such numbers. So I would say something like the seven smallest natural numbers that are one more than a perfect square. Uh, I'm going to have to modify that just a little bit. The one more than a perfect square. Uh, well, let me leave a little blank here. Because technically, there's one more perfect square that's not the perfect square of a natural number. It would be the square of 0. 0 squared is equal to 0. Um, and 0 squared plus 1 would be 1. So there is actually one smaller um, number, which is 1 more than a perfect square. Uh, so I'll just add in the word non-zero here, just to indicate. So that my verbal description is sufficiently specific um, that anybody looking at it would be able to recreate uh, my roster from my verbal description. So this is a set of all the seven smallest natural numbers that are one greater than a non-zero perfect square. So being able to get information into and especially out of set builder notation is something that's definitely worth a lot of practice uh, on your end. Because it doesn't come naturally, it doesn't come automatically. We are not born speaking mathematical notation. We're not even born speaking English, but we've had a lot more practice speaking English than we have speaking mathematical notation. Um, so that's definitely a place that I would recommend um, devoting a considerable amount of your review time uh, as we go forward into this exam. So the next place that I want to go uh, is I want us to get back into thinking about unions and intersections. So um, this is the um, this is the material that really was our introduction to sort of set um, set theory operations. So how do we use um, how do we take different sets and, and sort of glue them together to make more interesting sets? How do we get new sets from old? Um, this also lets us sort of coast directly into our discussion about set algebra and Venn diagrams. So rather than making this sort of a, a separate discussion, let's just do one quick uh, review problem uh, on this material so that we can move forward to the uh, topic number two material, which is a little bit more meat on the bone. Um, so let me find quickly here a problem uh, that we can sink our teeth into. And I think I've got one. Just give me a second to grab it out of Newton Alta, and I can put it onto our canvas here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and send it to my iPad. So in this problem, what we're given is we're given a universal set. Uh, we're given two subsets, A and B, of that universal set. Um, and then we're given an expression uh, using set algebra operations and asked to determine a roster uh, for that expression. Uh, so as soon as I get this up on the screen here, uh, we'll do this together. All right, so here's our problem. So in this problem, we're given a universal set that's described to us right here. So we have the whole roster for it. And then we're given a subset A and a subset B, and we're asked, what is the quantity B intersect A complement? Right. So of course, as I always do in these problems, the tool that I use, and the tool I encourage you to use, is a Venn diagram. Um, even if you don't consider yourself to have a visual preference for learning and understanding, um, I think there's still value in Venn diagrams, even just as a communicative tool. 
Um, even if you don't need set uh, Venn diagrams yourself to understand how to work with sets, um, other people probably do. And so get in the habit of using Venn diagrams to communicate. So because I have two sets, A and B, uh, in my universe, two, two subsets in my universe, um, I'm going to draw in a two-set Venn diagram, a MasterCard logo, as I often call it, uh, as my tool. So I'm just going to draw it in. Here's my template. Um, I'm going to label my sets here, A and B. Again, I like to put my labels uh, as situated in the in a broken part of the circle here, just so that we don't confuse them with elements. Those are the names of sets, and they're not elements of any given set. Um, and so now what I want to do is just fill in this Venn diagram with as much information as we have about A, about B, and about the universe. So the first thing I'll do is I want to fill in the elements of A. And so we're given those five elements uh, up here. So let me just write those in. 5, 11, 3, 8, and 9. And so for starters, I'm just going to put those inside A. 5, 11, 3, 8, and 9. And then I'm going to do the same thing with B. So B, we're given those five elements, 99, 5, 11, 2, and 4. We'll drop those into the set B, 5, 11, 2, and 4. And before I move on, I want to figure out if any of those elements need to be moved into the overlap, uh, into this set, which is common to both A and B. I'm going to quickly shade it here because I also want to take this opportunity to give that set a name. That set in which A and B overlap is what we know to be the intersection. A intersect B. Okay. So whatever elements we put there will be the elements that belong to A intersect B. And those are going to be the ones that A and B have in common. So let's go one at a time. A has a 5. B also has a 5. And because I cannot and should not put any element in more than one region of a Venn diagram that's guiding principle number one of any Venn diagram, no element can appear in more than one region, I can't have 5 in both the A circle and the B circle. It has to go here uh, in the intersection. So I move the 5 into the middle because it's common to both sets. 11, also common to both sets. It belongs to A, it belongs to B. We can't have it in more than one region, so I have to move 11 to the middle as well. The rest of the elements in A, 3, 8, and 9, are not elements of B. And the rest of the elements of B, 99, 4, and 2, are not elements of A. And so those elements stay where they are. So now I've got the elements of A and the elements of B all residing in exactly one and only one region uh, of this set. So now we're in good shape. The only thing we haven't done is we haven't labeled the rest of the universe. Remember, the universe sort of fences in my backyard and says, here are all of the toys you can play with in your backyard. Okay. Here are all the things that you can put into one or more of these subsets or not put into one or more of these subsets. So it defines my whole playing field. So anything which I haven't already written as part of my sets A or B, which does belong to this universe, will belong to the region outside of A and B, outside of my two circles. So I'm just going to go again one element at a time. Five? Well, I've already got my five. Uh, as part of my diagram. So I'm just going to kind of check it off. Well, that's taken care of. 16, on the other hand, well, 16 is not already in my diagram, so I'm going to add it to my diagram. 4 is already in my diagram as part of the set B. 12 is not in my diagram yet, so I have to add it. 2 is already in my diagram. It's part of the set B, so I don't need to add it again. Remember, it can't go in more than one place. 11 already in my diagram, so we can check it off. 99 is already in my diagram, so is 3. 1 is not in my diagram, so I do need to add 1. Check it off. 9 is already in my diagram, and 8 is already in my diagram. Okay. So going through the rest of my universe, I found out that there were only three uh, elements that weren't already accounted for as part of the subsets A and B. So I add those outside of A and B, but still as part of my universe. All right, so now my Venn diagram is complete. But I haven't answered the question. Uh, the question asks us for presumably a roster for the set B intersection A sort of quantity, right? So with those parentheses, group B intersection A, and then take the complement of that. So what I want to do is to get us the practice of 
sort of diagramming out using a Venn diagram which regions of this Venn belong to the complement of the quantity B intersect A. So let me just do that by starting out with a blank Venn diagram with A and B as my two uh, circles here, my two sets, right? We label those once again. So here's my set A, there's my set B. And then what I want to do is go one step at a time through taking apart those set operations. So I kind of label this as start over here. And thinking about the order of operations, right? the old PEMDAS, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, the same kind of PEMDAS applies for sets, where we want to look at parentheses first. And then we want to look at exponents, which in our set land takes the realm of complementation. And then multiplication and division, which in our language becomes intersections. And then finally, unions. There's the order of precedence for set operations. So rather than PEMDAS, it becomes PCIU. PCIU. I wish it were easier to pronounce, but unfortunately it's not. Um, so we'll look at parentheses first. And what that means for us is that the first place I want my eyes to go in this expression is B intersect A. So that's the first set that I want to diagram here, B intersect A. And so then we have to ask ourselves, what region of this Venn diagram is B intersect A? Well, it's going to be those elements that are common to both the set B and the set A. In other words, it's exactly where A and B overlap one another. It's the same thing as A intersect B, by the way. And so in step one of this analysis, I'm going to shade just this region where my A and my B overlap. And now that I've found the region that lists inside the parentheses, now at my next step, I just want to take the complement of that. So B intersection A parentheses complement. And so the step here is just to take the complement the complement of the orange shaded region. Remember, complement is what we talk about in logical terms is corresponding to the word not. So the complement of B intersect A is going to contain all the elements which do not belong to B intersect A. So it's going to contain everything except for the region that I shaded at this stage. All the complement does is it turns our set inside out. Everything that used to be in is now out. Everything that used to be out is now in. And so when I shade that region, I'm going to shade everything except for the region that I previously shaded. Everything outside of the intersection of A and B. So hopefully this shading is legible for you. right? So I've now shaded exactly that region which was not shaded in my previous step. And so this shaded region is now where I want to get my answer from. right? I want, as a roster for this set, to take everything which is in my orange shaded regions on this side. So just to avoid confusion, let me take away the orange shading uh, that we had from this diagram and reintroduce the shading that I want to get my final answer in this problem which is to shade, again, everything outside of B intersect A. And so anything which I'm shading, any element which I'm now uh, shading in, will become an element in my roster for my final answer. So B intersect A quantity complement is going to have as a roster, I'll just go through and list every element that I just uh, counted as part of my shaded region. So 1 is in there, 2 is in there, 3 is in there, 4 is in there. Uh, but 5 is not, right? So take careful attention to what's not in my finished answer here. 5 is not a part of my answer because it was a part of the, comp uh, of the intersection of B with A. Um, and then the next biggest number here that would belong is 8, 9, 11, 12, 16. No, I wrote down 11, but 11 is actually in the intersection. So 11 does not belong. Uh, 12, 16, 
and 99. And there would be my final answer for this. So I think the most important part of these kinds of processes is the step-by-step -step that we did over here on this side, right? That analytical way of taking a set expression like quantity B intersection A complement and breaking that down to understand which regions in the Venn diagram that that actually corresponds to. That actually is the key process that I want to reinforce in our next example uh, when we look at um, how to assess the equality of set uh, algebraic operations um, using a Venn diagram that might include three sets uh, instead of just two. So that's the next example uh, that I want us to look uh, forward to. So we've seen a, a, an example here where we step by step sort of shaded in the regions of a Venn diagram uh, that were described by a piece of uh, set algebraic operation. Um, let's repeat that, but sort of take it up a notch by using more than two sets uh, this time. So what I'd like to do um, is ask the following question. Let me grab it from our, uh, from our board over here real quick. Uh, actually, yeah, here we go. So let me gra quickly grab this and put it on my iPad uh, so that we can look at it together. So what we're going to do in this problem uh, is decide whether or not two set algebraic uh, expressions describe the same set, whether those two sets are equal. Um, and we're going to use Venn diagrams in order to do that uh, process. So again, let me just get it onto our canvas here. And then we'll be able to go directly ahead and do this problem. OK. So here's what the problem looks like. Um, we're given two pieces of uh, set uh, theoretic uh, expressions. I'm going to shade them in into contrasting colors here. On the one hand, we have the expression C intersected with the union of A with B. And on the other side of the equation, we have a different expression, which is the quantity C intersected A union with the quantity C intersect with B. And we're asked to determine whether or not those two are the same set or whether they might be different sets. And so as to avoid confusion, I'm going to recolor this one, so purple and orange. So ultimately, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to come up with a Venn diagram uh, that adequately describes both of these uh, two sides of this equation and figure out whether they legitimately describe exactly the same set or whether there is a difference. And if there's any difference, if there's any region in this Venn diagram which belongs to one of these shaded sets and not the other, then we cannot say that those two sets are equal. So that's our guiding principle, is in order to have two sets be equal, we need them both to describe exactly the same regions in a Venn diagram. Everything which belongs to one of them must also belong to the other. So let me get a, another blank Venn diagram uh, on the board here that we can use to start doing this work. Actually, I'm going to get a couple just to make our lives easier here. So here's one. And let me put another. OK. And so what we want to do ultimately is try and shade in the regions that are described by each of these expressions and decide whether or not we're shading the same regions in both of those cases. And so again, what I want us to get in the habit of doing is taking a step-by-step -step approach um, to figuring out which regions are being described. And here's what I have in mind for that looking like. Right. So we're going to start. I'm going to take my purple set expression here, C intersected with the union of A with B. I'm going to start with a blank Venn diagram. And then again, I'm going to follow that sort of set order of operations that we talked about a minute ago. Parentheses first, then worry about complements, then intersections, and unions at the end. So for that, what I want to do is look inside these parentheses and worry first about A union B. What is A union B going to look like? So this is a good opportunity uh, for us to, um, to use our set uh, operations uh, to figure out how all of this works. So A union B, remember, consists of all the elements that are in A 
together with all the elements that are in B. A union is an inclusive operation. It just piles all the elements from both sets together. And so A union B is going to consist of everything from A together with everything from B. So there is a shading uh, for my first step in which I take the sets A and B and I union them together. Then what I want to do is I want to intersect that with C. And that's what I'm going to get when I have the expression on the left side of my uh, uh, purported equation up here. C intersected with, uh, whoops, C intersected with the union of A with B. And what happens when I intersect? I'm going to take just those parts of my shaded set which are also part of the set C. Remember, intersection is exclusive. It looks at just where the sets overlap. So where does A union B overlap with the set C? Well, it's going to overlap in exactly those parts of the shaded area that also happen to belong to the C circle. So just those places within the C circle. So if I shade my C circle, maybe if I have my C circle in red here, right, then those places where a union B overlaps with C are going to be exactly those regions which are shaded both yellow and orange, uh, uh, yellow and red, rather, in this picture. And so that's going to give me these three regions right here. A union B intersected with C is going to have these three shaded regions in my Venn diagram. Okay. And so that's the set that we're describing on the left-hand side of this equation. Now let's look at the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, just as we did before, um, we'll start, just put a Venn diagram out here as a, as a starting point. And actually what I want to do is put two Venn diagrams in place for my starting point, and I'll tell you why in a second. So here I actually am using two Venn diagrams as a starting point because I'm kind of looking ahead uh, at the work we're going to have to do. And I have two sets of parentheses that are both going to be the first places that I look. I have a C intersect with A, and I have a C intersect with B. And so what I want is I want a Venn diagram that I can understand each of those two things separately. C intersect with A, C intersect with B. So I want to use a Venn diagram for each of those two things first, so that I can be working inside my parentheses. Let's shade C intersect A. C intersect A is going to consist of those regions that are common to both set C and set A. So that's the overlap between C and A. That's these two regions right there. So there is my C intersect A. Sorry, uh, that's, that's good enough. C intersect B, same story. It consists of those regions where C and B overlap one another. So we'll shade in the overlap between C and B. And so there is the first steps, right? I look inside of my parentheses. Now that I've identified the expressions inside my parentheses, now my job is to take, evidently, the union of those two things. Union. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to combine together all the elements from one of those sets with all the elements of the other set. Just glue them together, stick them together, be inclusive, one big tent, everybody in the pool. Right? And when I do that with this brown set and with that brown set, the regions that I end up shading are all the regions from my set on the left, which are these two, together with all the regions from my set on the right, which are those two. And that then gives me a full shading of the regions that make up the set described by the expression on the right-hand side of this equation. So our last question is, have we described two equal sets? Have we shaded exactly the same regions in the set in the left side of this equation as we have on the right? And just by looking at these Venn diagrams, we can conclude that the answer is yes. We've shaded all the same regions on the left as we did on the right. And therefore, for any sets A, B, and C, this set expression and that set expression describe exactly the same set at the end of the day. 
So again, the key skill here is not really the skill at the end where we're assessing the equality, because uh, that's easy. You look at the two Venn diagrams, and are they exactly the same? Then great. If they're not, if there's even a single difference between which regions are shaded, then they're not equal sets. So the key skill is that analytical step-by-step -step process of shading one part of a region at a time, using the set operations to figure out what to do next. Um, so get practice with that, and that will go a really long way. So what I want to do to round out our set conversation um, is to take a moment and analyze a survey problem. So use all of this set theory um, uh, tool work to depict the results of a survey having two or three categories of respondents in it. Um, so that we can understand how to take the information in that survey apart and put it back together. So give me a moment here to grab uh, an example out of, our, uh, out of our stuff. And we'll move forward from there. So here's an example, again, uh, taken from our Newton Alta uh, materials. Let me get it into my iPad here real quick. One of the challenges with this, as with any story problem uh, in mathematics, is just getting the information out of a written verbal sort of paragraph form uh, and figuring out how to make sense of and organize the information that's been given to us um, in a way that's going to be useful uh, analytically. So here's what the problem itself looks like, just as a paragraph. It says that a survey of 101 college students um, found that 18 take only algebra, 21 take only statistics, 25 take only precalculus, um, 10 take only algebra and statistics, 9 take only statistics and precalc, 2 take all three, and 15 take none of the courses in the survey. And the question is, how many take only algebra and precalculus? So let's take a moment and put in a blank Venn diagram that we're going to use to sort of contain all the results from our survey. And here I want to, in addition to my three circles for my sets, I also want to draw in a, a universe, a rectangle that goes around the whole thing. Okay. U for universe. OK. So how are we going to do this? So doing a survey problem um, requires us to take the information that's given to us and situate it in a Venn diagram. And in these Venn diagrams, rather than sort of write in the elements as part of my diagram, instead I'm going to just write in the cardinal numbers of the regions in my Venn diagram. Um, just because I don't want to draw in 21 dots uh, inside of the statistics circle, because it's just too much to, to keep track of mentally. Um, so let's start by defining our three sets, A, B, and C in my Venn diagram. So we can tell we have three categories uh, in this survey. Um, just because, reading through this paragraph, um, we've got students taking algebra, we've got students taking statistics, we've got students taking precalculus. And so those are three independent categories. So A is the set of students taking algebra. B is the set of students taking statistics, and C, the set of students taking precalculus. I'm going to write precalc. Right. So that's going to be what my three sets in my Venn diagram are trying to depict. Um, and so what we've got in this paragraph up here um, is a couple of numbers that we can use right away. Um, in particular, the first thing that I want to look at is, are there any numbers that describe whole sets? Any numbers describing whole sets? In other words, does this problem tell me anything about the total number, the total cardinal number of a set? And I would say, um, that there's actually only one place in which this paragraph is giving me information about a whole set. And that's in the very first thing that it says, a survey of 101 college students. So that 101 is the cardinal number of some set in my survey. In particular, it's the cardinal number for my universe. And so, as I always do, I'm going to place that information about whole sets. 
I'm just going to place it adjacent to the name of my set in my Venn diagram. I don't want to place it in any region. That's probably the first place where people go wrong in constructing their Venn diagrams for these. Don't put it in a region. But we do want to put it somewhere that will help us to remember what it means. And so I'll put it next to the name, next to the set name. That's at least what I do, just to try and avoid confusion. Because for example, if I placed 101 here, I might think that that's how many uh, respondents are in this region, which is the complement of the union of A, B, and C. That's probably not true. But there are 101 total respondents within my whole universe. There's 101 people that need to be somewhere inside of this rectangle. Right? And that U101 right here is going to help me to remember that. Um, but none of these other numbers are telling me anything about a whole set. For example, this 18 is not the total number of respondents who take algebra. This is the total number of respondents that take only algebra. So that's the next thing that I would pay attention to, is are there any onlys? Because onlys are cheap. Onlys don't require us to do any additional work in order to figure out where they belong on our Venn diagram. Because onlys do belong to a region. And we don't have to do any arithmetic or any uh, double counting, anything fussy, to figure out where the onlys go. So for example, this 18 who take only algebra, so again, the key word there being only, the 18 that take only algebra must be inside my A circle, but not inside my B circle and not inside my C circle. So where do the only algebra people live in my Venn diagram? They're going to live here, in that region the place where the only algebra uh, respondents are to be found. So there's 18 of them, and I can put them right into their region right now. Done. And we can continue, because we also have information about the number of respondents who take only statistics. There's 21 of them, and because the word only is there, I know that they belong exactly to that region, the region that is in B, but is not in A, and is not in C, because those students are only taking statistics and not algebra and not precalculus. Same thing with the 25 taking only precalculus. I know that they belong exactly to this region here, 25. That doesn't always happen in the setup of a survey problem, but when it does happen, it's super helpful, because we can put those onlys directly where they go. And as I continue reading, actually, there's more onlys um, that, that I can put in here. There are 10 students that take only algebra and statistics, but not precalculus. That, though, is going to take a little bit more doing, um, because the, the, the description, well, no, actually, I think we're good. 10 students take only algebra and statistics, but not precalculus. So where do they live on this Venn diagram? Where are those 10 respondents? again because of the word only. Well algebra and statistics, the sets A and B, they overlap in these two regions right here. But the fact that these students take only algebra and statistics but not precalculus means that they might be in this region but they cannot be here. So they're in the A circle and the B circle but they're not in the C circle. So those 10 respondents are in this region where A overlaps with B but not C. So those 10 will situate right there in the middle. And as we keep reading, we find out that we get a bunch more of nice onlys. Nine take only statistics and precalculus. And so those nine are in the overlap between B and C, but not A. And then finally, we find out that two students take all three. And that two is really valuable. Whoops. There are two students that take all three of these courses. And that all three describes for me the intersection of A, B, and C there in the center. So we'll put two there in the middle. And finally, 15 students take none of the courses in the survey. So that's the last piece of information we're going to get. And those students, therefore, those respondents, belong outside of my regions A, B, and C. So we've now gotten all of our information into this Venn diagram that, that we have from the problem. Now, and we probably should have done this at the very beginning, um, but let's 
carefully ask, what question are we trying to answer? The question is, how many students take only algebra and pre-calculus? So where are we going to find that region in our Venn diagram? It's going to be where the algebra circle and the pre-calculus circle overlap, but which do not overlap the statistics circle. That's this region right here. So however many respondents belong in this region, that's how many are going to answer our question. So we just have to figure out how many that is. And fortunately, this problem was set up for us uh, in a convenient fashion that we don't have to do a ton of arithmetic to tease it apart. Um, because we already have labeled literally every other region in this Venn diagram because of all the onlys that were given to us uh, in this data. So all we have to do now is just ask, if this unknown number is x, then what does x have to satisfy? Well, we know that there were 101 respondents in the survey in total, so there have to be 101 respondents inside of my rectangle. But all of my other regions have already been numbered with their cardinal numbers. So if I add those all up, 18 plus 10 plus 21 plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if I add up all of the cardinal numbers of the regions inside of my diagram, they all need to add up to 101. 18, 10, 21, 15, 2, 9, 25, and x. Those all have to add up to 101. So I might write down this little equation. Then all I have to do is add up. What is 18 plus 10 plus 21 plus 15 plus 2 plus 9 plus 25? Uh, is 100. And so I get this little equation that looks like 100 plus x is equal to 101. So how do I solve this for x? Well, and we'll talk a lot more about this kind of thing in our next unit of the course. I just have to subtract 100 from both sides of this equation. That gets me the x by itself on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, 101 minus 100, x is equal to 1. And so there was only one student who took only algebra and pre-calculus in this survey. So this is an example of what survey problems can look like. Although I'd say this is an example that's a little bit more on the elementary side um, because of all of the word onlys uh, that showed up in the statement of this problem. That really gave us a short field because we were able to label all of these regions right off the bat. We almost never, except for this one case, had to do any arithmetic to account for any possible double counting. Um, so I do want to quickly change the ball game a little bit um, just to remind ourselves of how things can be different uh, if the information is presented to us in a slightly different format. So let's just change up, whoops, let's change up the statement of this problem a little bit, um, just so that we can remember what some of the degree of difficulty can be uh, in working a problem like this. Uh, whoops. All right, so let me get this info off of our Venn diagram again. Um, and so now, let's imagine uh, that the way that this information was given to us looked like this instead. So a survey of 101 college students found that, so I'm going to rewrite the problem a little bit. So here's how I'm going to change the game. Um, found that, I don't know, 54 took algebra. Um, 40 took statistics abbreviate that stats. Um, 27 took pre-calculus. Um, and then I'm going to remove, so I'm going to take out a lot of these words only. Um, so algebra and statistics, um, let's say uh, 9 took algebra and statistics. Um, 9 took statistics and pre-calculus. 2 take all 3, and 15 take none of the courses in the survey. So I've essentially taken out every place that the word only uh, appeared in the original statement of this problem. Um, so that let's go back through and figure out what to do in the absence of that convenient word. If we don't have that word, what we need to do is work from the overlaps out.
And what I mean by that is we go to the place in this Venn diagram at which the most number of my circles overlap. And if I know the cardinal number there, write it in. And then work our way outwards to the places where only two sets overlap. Figure out if we can figure out uh, figure out if we can quantify those overlaps. And then from there, work our way out to the places that are in one regions that are in one set but not the other two. Um, so following our step by step again, are there any numbers that are describing whole sets? Well, sure, this 101. But now that I've taken the word only out of the descriptions here. Now these numbers, 54, 40, and 27, those numbers are now describing for me the entirety of the set A, 54. So there need to be a total of 54 respondents inside of this circle. In the four regions that make up this circle, there need to be 54 total respondents. Same thing with this B circle. Its four regions have to total 40. And the C circle, its four regions have to total 27. So now I put those numbers there next to the names of those sets. There aren't any only in this example, so I can't label any other regions at this time. So I have to go to work from the overlaps out. So the first place I want to look is in the intersection of all three, the, the nexus of the universe. Do I know from the statement of my problem how many respondents were in the intersection of all three sets taking algebra, statistics, and pre-calculus? And the answer is yes. There are two that take all three. And so that's the first number now that I'm going to write into this diagram. There are two respondents that take all three. And now I've gotten my most overlapped part of my Venn diagram is labeled. So we're, we're, we started strong. Now I have to work my way outwards and figure out how many students take algebra and statistics. So according to this, nine students take algebra and statistics. Let me highlight that observation. And then in my diagram, where are the students who take algebra and statistics? They're in the overlap, the intersection of A with B. And so there need to be a total of nine respondents inside that intersection of A with B. But two of those respondents are already there as part of the intersection of all three sets. Therefore, the number of students and respondents that belong to this region is not nine, but it's nine minus two. Nine take away two so that we don't double count the two respondents that were already part of the triple intersection. Right? So if you're not doing subtraction as part of a survey problem, you might want to look again at how you're working that problem, because you might be missing something uh, if you don't end up doing this kind of subtraction. Because unless we're given this great information with all the words only, like we were given in the first version of this problem, um, then we can't take for granted that we're not double counting people if we write um, uh, numbers directly into regions of this Venn diagram. Okay, so continuing with my double intersections, statistics and precalculus, that would be where B intersects with C. So that would be this overlap here. And according to the information that's now given to us in the problem, there need to be a total of nine respondents in that intersection. So if there need to be nine in that intersection, well, there's already two uh, in my intersection of all three. And so the number that need to be in this double intersection is again, nine minus two. Right? So now I've got nine respondents in uh, that are taking statistics and pre-calculus, two of which are taking all three courses. Again, how many students take only algebra and pre-calculus? That's the, the, the question we're being asked here. So that's the unknown that we need to try and figure out. So I'm going to, again, highlight that region. And I'm going to write in an unknown variable. I'm just going to call it x. Or at the very least, uh, yeah, no, so I guess that x is what we're trying to figure out uh, in our answer to this uh, survey problem. OK. So how do we proceed from here? Well, um, we have, uh, for my statistics students, we have three out of the four regions in my statistics circle have been filled in. Seven here, two here, seven there. We know there need to be 40 total in my statistics circle. So now we can label this remaining portion of my uh, statistics set B. Because we know for sure 
that whatever this number is here, I'm going to call this, uh, let me just call it lowercase b, that when I add 7 plus 2 plus 7 plus b, I need to get 40. Right? The total number of respondents in this circle need to be 40. And we've already accounted for 7 plus 7, which is 14, plus 2, which is 16 of them. So 16 plus b equals 40. Subtract 16 from both sides. 40 minus 16 is going to give me 24. So now I know there's 24 respondents uh, in that circle. Also, I guess I didn't label this. 15 respondents took none of the courses in the survey, and so we should put 15 here on the outside of everything. OK, and from here, things get a little bit more interesting, uh, I guess, because um, we've got, we need there to be 54 total respondents inside of this circle. But seven of them are already accounted for here, two of them are accounted for here, an unknown number is accounted for here, and another unknown number is accounted for here. So this actually, I made up this problem on the fly, so it's actually a little more complicated um, than I'm hoping. But there's 54 minus 7 minus 2 minus x. That's the number of respondents who would be in this circle. And for the same reason, there'd be 27 minus 7 minus 2 minus x uh, respondents inside of the c circle, whatever x ends up uh, being. Um, and then the one other thing that we haven't used yet is we haven't used the fact that there's 15 respondents on the outside and 101 respondents in total in my survey. But I think we have enough information to actually finish this problem. This is probably the most complicated survey problem example that we've seen. Um, because now I've labeled all of my regions, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all eight of the regions in my Venn diagram are now labeled. So if I add all of their cardinal numbers up, I should get 101. So let's try that. I'm going to clear out some space up here. So if I add up the cardinal numbers of all my regions, I'm going to get uh, 15 plus 24 plus 7 plus 2 plus 7 plus x plus 54 minus 7 minus 2 minus x plus 27 minus 7 minus 2 minus x. And all those have to add together to give me 101. Okay. So I add the cardinal numbers of all my regions. I have to get 101, because that's how many respondents were in the survey. That's my universe. And now, if I just simplify this giant expression, I can add and subtract all the numbers. 15 plus 24 plus 7 plus 2 plus 7 plus 54 minus 7 minus 2 plus 27 minus 7 minus 2. Um, I get 118. So I'm going to have to cannibalize some of what I wrote down here. Apologies for that. I get 118. And when I combine my x's, I have one of them here minus one of them. Those are going to cancel. And then I'm going to get minus x left over. And so the equation I end up needing to solve looks like 118 minus x equals 101, which I can solve. The way I like to do it is add x to both sides and also subtract 101 from both sides so that on the right-hand side of the equation, I get x. On the left-hand side, I have 118 minus 101. And that's 17. And then therefore, that ends up being my answer. So after doing that little bit of algebra, we find out that if I put 17 here, then that means that I should also be able to label my other missing regions. Uh, for example, this region here inside of the A circle would be 54 minus 7 minus 2 minus 17, which ends up being 28 when I do that simplification. And then this region, 27 minus 7 minus 2 minus 17 is 1. And so I get 1 respondent in this region. And now that everything has been labeled, whoops, now that everything's been labeled, now everything's a number again. And we should probably check our work, right? Um, we could go through and just make sure that everything adds up to 101 again. Um, but I'll leave that for you as an exercise. Again, we've kind of gone from the simplest example of a survey problem where all the onlys in the sentence were given to us, let us label the regions right away.
And we've gone straight to probably the most complex example of a survey problem, where we don't have any onlys, so no regions that we can label. And the question that's being asked asks us for an unknown region, which is actually involved in more than one set. And so we end up setting up this equation with an unknown variable x in it uh, that we can solve to figure out how to quantify that last region. So survey problems really do run the gamut. Um, and so these couple of examples showed a little bit of a bookend on both sides. If you hung with this last example, you are in great shape for doing any survey problem that I throw at you. Let's turn the page and talk about logical reasoning uh, to end up our stream in about the next half an hour or so. So when we talked about logical reasoning, um, the, the questions that we asked are really, first of all, sort of what is logic about? Um, and second of all, how do we assess whether a logical argument has a valid form? Um, what even is a logical argument? And is an argument uh, that we see, is it a valid form of argument? Um, so the first thing I want to do uh, is kind of go back to that logic to English dictionary. How do we take a, a logical assertion uh, and sort of decompose it uh, down into logical notation? How do we use logical both quantifiers and then also um, uh, uh, connectives uh, to describe the, the form of a logical assertion. So I want to start out with the following problem that I'm again sort of taking from our, uh, our Newton-Alta uh, assignment here. So in this problem, uh, you're given a, a logical statement uh, and asked to sort of identify what is the, what is the logical form uh, of this statement. So let me grab this real quick. This is kind of a short problem, but again, as in our last example, I want to make it a little bit more intricate uh, as we go along here so that we get a sense of what the spectrum of challenge is on a topic like the Logic to English Dictionary uh, that we're trying to build. Oops. Let me just make sure I bookmark this. out of my agenda here. There we go. Um, so in our Logic to English Dictionary, uh, here's the first question that I want to tackle, um, starting from a relatively straightforward problem. So this problem, um, we're given a logical statement. If time is money and money is freedom, then time is freedom. And we're asked to represent that logical assertion in a symbolic form. So how do we do that? Well, the first sort of splendid thing that was given to us in this problem um, is that we're sort of told how to decompose this sentence into a couple of atomic logical propositions. Um, I'm going to kind of write this on a single line here. If time is money and money is freedom, then time is freedom. Um, so we're actually given in the statement of this problem that they would like for us to use the symbol P to represent this part of the assertion. Time is money and money is freedom. So looking in my sentence, all of that is part of that first clause. Um, so they're giving us permission in how they've set up this problem to call that whole thing a single logical proposition P. Okay. So if we do that, then I'm just going to kind of write a P above that whole portion of this statement. And then likewise, we're sort of given permission here to consider the statement time is freedom to be our second part of this proposition and call it Q. And so likewise, I'll highlight this part and I'll just write a Q underneath it. And after I've done that, I can kind of observe that the form that this now takes is if P, then Q. And then the question is, how do we further reduce this down to use logical notation to represent if P, then Q? What does that look like? Well, remember, back when we first introduced logical connectives, that we have this whole symbolic language uh, that we can use to describe um, the, the symbols that we use to represent logical uh, connections. And if then, 
or a word like implies, that implies what logicians call a conditional proposition, where the truth of the hypothesis guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Um, so hold on, let me pause for just one moment and I'll be right back. I'm sorry, I'm still actually. Um, okay, busy, so, um, can I come back? Well, the meeting's at 2.15. Oh, that's today. Uh, I will be there okay. <laughs> at 2.15. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so we have a symbol, the forward-facing arrow, uh, that represents the if-then uh, connective in logic. And so that's the one that we want to use here, uh, just to finish up this uh, example. If p, then q is represented in notation as just an arrow, p arrow q. Right. And so there would be how we wrap up that example. But chances are uh, that if I give you a problem like this one, um, that probably um, I would do something more with it. Um, rather than giving you permission to consider this entire compound statement, time is money and money is freedom, as a single logical proposition, probably what I would have done if I wrote this problem is say, well, let's let P just be the time is money part. And let's let Q uh, be time is freedom, once again. Um, but then we'll make money is freedom a separate proposition. Let me call that R, for example. So how would this change the work that we have to do? Well, once again, once we've identified the three individual logical components of this argument and called them P, R, and Q, uh, respectively, um, then I would just sort of copy down. All right, now the logical form is if P and Q, or sorry, P and R, then Q. So now that's the logical form of this. We haven't completely notationalized it yet because I have an if then and I also have an and. Um, but since I have both of them in the same expression, I want to be real careful um, that I'm thinking about the order of precedence. Um, that's just like the order of operations uh, for, for sets. So uh, with sets, remember we did parentheses first and then we did complements. then we did intersections, and then we did unions. That was the order of operations that applied to sets. Well, the same thing applies to logical propositions and their connectives, um, and in the same order. So complements corresponds in set language to negations. If I have a not in my uh, assertion, I should think about that before I think about intersection, which corresponded to conjunction or and. If I have an and, I would think of that after I think about negation. And then if I had a disjunction, an or, I would think about that last. But I would use parentheses, as we always do, as ways of grouping and subverting the order of operations so that we can do lower, precedent, uh, lower precedence operations before higher precedence operations. OK. So according to this, if I don't add any parentheses in, the first thing that's going to happen um, well, I guess what I didn't do is I didn't add conditionals uh, on here. Um, and the conditional actually is, mm, a conditional is a combination of complements, intersections, and unions, actually intersections and unions. Um, and so I would actually add uh, if-thens uh, at the same level as my intersections. So let's put if-then at the same level. So the if then um, is going to have a higher precedence. And so if I just look at this sentence right here, the first thing that I would see is r then q. Uh, but that's not what I want to see here. Uh, what I want to see is p and r then q. So I actually want this p and r to happen first. And so what I'll do is I'll use parentheses to make sure and you can never go wrong by using more parentheses than you think you need. I don't say never, but um, usually uh, when uh, people who are learning this uh, make errors on this, usually it's because they're not using enough grouping. Um, so I'll group this P and R together so that they together become a part of the hypothesis of my if-then. And then that if-then can turn into an arrow. 
and the conclusion of the if then is q. So that would then be my final answer uh, for this piece of notation. Uh, so I just wanted to get that out there as a, as a cautionary uh, tale to figure out um, you know, why parentheses might be important in representing a, um, a, a logical argument using notation. So I want to conclude today's live stream um, by looking at some more examples of assessing the validity of the form of an argument, um, figuring out whether if we believe uh, the premises of an argument, must we believe the conclusion of that argument? Um, and the key, again, visual language uh, for doing this uh, is the Euler diagram. So let's look at a couple of examples of uh, assessing uh, validity for arguments uh, to wrap up today's stream. So I may end up skipping over a full discussion about true statements. Um, we may do a little bit more of that later. Um, but let's talk about validity for arguments. So what does it mean, again, for an argument to be valid? An argument is valid when its premises necessitate its conclusion. And that's a really sort of formal way to say the following. It's a formal way of saying whenever the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Right? And it's because of this whenever word here that I think you know novice logicians get tripped up uh, sometimes with understanding what validity means and what validity looks like. Um, so let's diagram out uh, an argument and see how we can use an Euler diagram to kind of figure out uh, whether or not an argument form is valid. So here's an example uh, of an argument. <clears throat> so this, I'm um, taking this example from the work of a ph French philosopher and mathematician, René Descartes. Um, and he was a scholar that thought a lot about mind-body duality and the difference between our, our bodies and our souls, our bodies and our minds, and that kind of thing. Um, and so he says um, uh, in one of his writings uh, that all bodies are divisible. So bodies, our human bodies, are made up of divisible parts. So we can sort of identify different parts of our bodies. Um, but then he also makes the argument no minds are divisible. So we can't sort of, in Descartes' view, um, sort of think about different parts of our mind. That our mind is one thing, but our bodies are many things, sort of pieced together. Um, and the argument that he makes is that, therefore, no minds are bodies. It's not possible for a mind to be a body. Right? So this is kind of a, it sounds a little bit weird, but this is how a lot of sort of philosophy kind of boils down to assertions like these, a logical assertion like these. And so what we're asked to do uh, when we're trying to determine whether or not this is valid is we're asked to assume that these premises are true. Basically, we have to let we have to go all the way up to that line with Descartes. And we say, okay, let's let's assume, let's grant that your two premises are true statements. And then the question for us is, must this conclusion be true? Do I have to believe the thing below the line once I believe the things above the line? That's what validity is about. So that's the question we need to answer. If I believe the two things above the line, do I have to believe the thing below the line? So we'll use, um, we'll use an Euler diagram to, to do this work. So let's start by figuring out what is the form of the argument that he's making here. 
um, I want to either write it in terms of logical propositions like P and Q, or if you like, we could write it in terms of sets like A and B. Uh, we might get some practice doing it both ways. Let's first look at his, what's sometimes called the first premise or the major premise. All bodies are divisible. Let me take this opportunity to assign some uh, symbols or some notation to this. Let's call bodies, um, let's call those B. So all B are divisible. So that which is divisible, we're going to give that a name also. Call that D. All B are D. All bodies are divisible. And then the, and the second premise, no minds are divisible. So minds is my third new thing. Uh, that's part of my analysis here. So we're going to call minds. I'm going to give that a letter, uh, M. Right? So no M are D. So those are his two premises. And his conclusion is supposed to be that no M are B. Okay, so what that little exercise did, just taking the words out of it and replacing them with symbols, um, is it's kind of given us a, a way to focus on there's really just three things going on in this problem. There's three sets. There's B, the set of all bodies, there's D, the set of that which is divisible, whatever Rene Descartes means by divisible, and M is the set of all minds. So we have three sets. We'll call them B, M, and D. Let's sort of, just tentatively at least, um, draw them out as three circles in a Venn diagram. B, D, and M. All right, so there's my B, my D, and my M, sketched as a Venn diagram. But now what I want to do is I want to transform this Venn diagram into an Euler diagram. And the difference is that in Euler diagram, we can move my circles to indicate. And there's sort of two things that we want to be able to indicate here. We either want to be able to indicate subset relationships and also disjointness relationships. Those are two opposite ends of the spectrum. If one thing is a subset of another thing, we want to locate that circle within the larger circle. If two sets are disjoint from one another, then we want to make no overlap between those circles. So let's take Descartes' first premise. All bodies are divisible. And figure out how to represent that using um, my Venn circles down here. So I've got my body circle, which I've represented here in orange. I've got my set of everything which is divisible represented in blue. If it's true that all bodies are divisible, then everything which belongs to B must also belong to D. And so therefore, what I want to do is I want to take my B set and make it a portion of my D set. So I just want to move B inside of the D circle. Just scoot it to the interior. Right? Now, I've represented my major premise as part of my Euler diagram. Right? All of B lives inside of D. How about the second premise? No minds are divisible. So our first premise actually conveyed a subset relationship. B was a subset of D, because everything which is in B also belongs to D. The second premise, no minds are divisible. That actually conveys a disjointness relationship. That conveys that my set of all minds cannot be permitted to overlap my set of everything which is divisible. And so what I want to do is move my minds circle away from my divisible circle, situated alongside like this. So that now M and D are disjoint. Another way to say that is that M intersected with D is the empty set. There is no element which belongs to both of my two sets. M and D are disjoint. And so now I'm conveying both of Descartes' premises in my Euler diagram. So I'm going to consider this to be in my finished Euler diagram. We've got all bodies being divisible. All of my Bs are inside of D. But also, no minds are divisible. So none of M overlaps with D. 
And now we ask the question, do we have to believe Descartes' conclusion? Must we believe that no minds are bodies? Is it true that nothing from M may overlap with B? And our Euler diagram shows that in fact we do have to believe that conclusion. No M are B. Correct. Right? If we believe Descartes' two premises, then the Euler diagram which represents the relationship between the sets BD and M looks like this. And therefore, we must also believe the conclusion because there is nothing that belongs to both M and B simultaneously. M intersected with B is indeed empty. And for that reason, Descartes is a valid form of argument in this case. So the most important thing in arguing with Euler diagrams um, is to take the premises of the argument and assume that they're true. Use those premises to construct your Euler diagram. Make sure that your diagram is depicting both of the premises, or if there's multiple, if there's more than two, make sure your diagram has adequately depicted all of the premises in the argument. And once it's showing all the premises in the argument, then ask yourself, do I have to believe the conclusion? Must the conclusion be true once I have a diagram that shows that the premises are true? And that's how we assess arguments for validity. And that's a different thing than assessing whether or not a statement is true or false. Again, uh, validity is about a relationship between truth of premises and truth of conclusions. And it's a very different thing than uh, asking whether or not an argument is true. So that's going to wrap up our live stream for today. So your task, if you're in my course, is to work on exam three, or sorry, the exam one that contains all of these topics this week. Again, the exam is a chance for you to demonstrate your mastery of all three of the topics that appear on that exam. Um, the exam is an individual exercise, so please don't collaborate with one another. But if you do have questions from me about what I'm looking for in certain problems, do drop those into Slack, and I'm happy to address them there. Um, after the exam, we are going to completely turn the page uh, and begin looking at a new set of topics, uh, which is about how to use algebra to model real-world phenomena in data. We're going to spend about four or five weeks, and we're also going to launch our semester project as part of that exploration. So I look forward to looking at that together uh, with you next week. Um, in our next live stream, we're going to tackle the first topic in that, which is how do we use basic linear models uh, to model phenomena in data. And I look forward to it, and good luck on the exam.